Rocket. This is Pastor Keith McGee from Messiah Temple here in Chicago, Illinois. We are grateful to be here. God has been good. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. I can't say it enough. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof our hearts are glad. We hope that you're staying safe in place. We hope that you're being responsible out here, washing your hands, keeping your distance, and wearing your mask while you're in public. We can get through this pandemic together. But we are excited to announce that SVP TV Network has gone global. If you've got a smart TV device, if you got Roku, if you got Fire TV, if you got Apple TV, you can connect with SVP TV Network on those platforms. Look us up under Let's Go to Church and we can have a shouting good time. Shout out to Miss Debbie McLennan, all the work that she and her staff is doing by going global and taking the TV network and the TV ministry to higher heights. We are grateful to God for all these things and we're looking forward to you connecting with us on one of those streaming platforms. See you soon. My God, my God, my God, my God. Let's go to church, y'all. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Luke chapter 24, just one verse for your hearing today. Bow with me in the word of prayer, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There is none like you from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Woke up thinking of you for who you are. Even at this hour, we thank you for the things that you have done and for the rest of the day, the rest of the week, the rest of the month, the rest of the year. We're trusting you for what you're going to do. God is preaching time as much as at stake, and I need you to rise up from within me. It's the same old place. It's the same old prayer. Please preside over the preaching with precision, with passion, and with power. You know the frailty of all of our frames. You know the fragility of all of our forms. So again, God, we ask that you pardon us of our guilt, protect us with your goodness, provide for us with your grace, persuade us with your gospel, pour out your gift, make this word of yours believable and receivable. And may these people of yours be receptive as well as responsive to your holy word. Holy Spirit, this is your time to shine. Have your way. Do your thing. Think with my mind and speak with my mouth. You are the real preacher. It is our prayer today that you forgive us all our sins, scatter them as far as the east is from the west, even deposit them in the sea of forgetfulness. And then, Lord, we ask that you continue to convince, convict, and convert us over again into the conformity of Christ. It is in his peerless and powerful name that we pray. Thank God. And amen. Luke chapter 24, verse 3. Therein you shall find these words recorded for your listening as they have been translated in the English Standard Version. This is what my Bible says. But when they went in. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. When they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. That's enough. That, that's, just, that's enough. That, that's enough. That's enough. But when they went in, they did not find the body of our Lord Jesus. Just for a little while, put a tag on this sex and talk on this topic. It's empty. If 
If you don't mind helping me even right now, look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, the preacher's going to talk about. It's empty. Turn and look at somebody else and tell them, neighbor, the preacher's going to talk about. Oh, you ain't telling nobody. You didn't turn to nobody. But your responsibility is to tell somebody. It's empty. Sisters and brothers, for all practical purposes, the word empty, when used in general conversation or communication, is widely accepted as a negative and counterproductive word. Think of the traveling motorist by the side of the road who hits their own call button in their car or uses their phone to contact roadside assistance. The receptionist asks what might be the trouble and the answer given is I ran out of gas it's empty. A struggling sing single parent with hungry mouths to feed doesn't have two nickels to rub together. Bellies are growling. Eyes are shedding tears from the pangs of hunger. And the mother has to give the children the disappointing news that the refrigerator, the pantry, and the cabinets and cupboards are empty. It is negative. It is counterproductive when you're in the line at the store with a counter full of goods and you swipe your card to the embarrassment of the cashier telling you that it was declined. And you leave in dismay and you go and you check your balance on the bank application on your phone to, to get further injury to insult not knowing what happened. You thought you were careful. You thought you were prudent. But the account was empty. How many promises have been made to us? But when it was time to deliver, they overpromised and then under delivered. To you, beloved, those promises were empty. Emptiness 
is not something that we want in our lives. Emptiness is not something that we pursue. Emptiness is not something that we yearn long for or covet. Emptiness for all practical purposes is counterproductive. Uh -huh. The only positive information about something being empty was the news that we continue to celebrate in this 22nd century after the actual events of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. We shout, we worship, we dance, we clap, we cry, we run, because the grave is empty. Hallelujah, somebody. It is inspiration. It gives us hope when we understand the fact that the grave was empty, not because of what was re falsely reported in their communities during that time that they stole the body. But it was empty because, as Jesus had told them, if you destroy this temple, it's okay. Because on the third day, I'll raise it up again. Not completely understanding his teachings, they went through the motions of carrying out rites, rituals and practices as they have done other times for their dead. But when they got there to Jesus's tomb, they discovered that it was empty. Today of all days, believers, we gather in reflection on the powerful message that has been conveyed in this gospel and the others, particularly this verse, number three. For it speaks to us about the emptiness of the tomb where Jesus had been buried and the profound implications of that emptiness for all of humanity. Because Jesus died for all because all had sinned and all had come short of the glory of God. Man lost his perfection, his innocence in the garden with Adam and Eve. And that fall and that brokenness, that separation from God was passed on to every man, every woman that had been born ever since. It was their disobedience to God when he had commanded them, don't, don't touch the tree, don't eat from the tree, for the day in which you eat from the tree, you will surely die. The aid of the tree, we all know that. They didn't drop dead. They didn't give up the ghosts. Everything appeared to be fine until they looked around and the world looked different from them to them than it did before they ate. And then men began to go down a spiritual decline, but before they were escorted out of the garden, God told Eve, that your seed is a seed you know, is going to have his heel bruised by the serpent, but he will bruise the serpent's head. Took a long time, and there were many people involved in this process of getting us uh, where we are at the time of Jesus's incarnation and earthly life. God used a lot of people 
to help him to weave what theologians refer to as the crimson thread of redemption. No one was eligible, no one was able to right the ship. No one was capable to help man to regain his status quo with God. It took a God himself in order to get us right again with him. Jesus, sisters and brothers, came into the world where there was supposed to be no entrance. He was born of a virgin. Jesus, when he took the clouds and went back up to glory and took his earned seat at the right hand of God, he left the world where there was supposed to be no exit. And what I mean by that, as far as you and I have seen, as far as you and I know, we don't know anyone who has been raised from the dead. We don't know anyone who has escaped the tomb, even those that Jesus raised from the, raised from the dead, even those the apostles raised from the dead, they had to die again. Their loved ones, their families had to go through all of that again. But he promised that he would be the first fruits of the resurrection unto everlasting life. He knew his friend was sick. You remember in John chapter 11, he, he was teaching, he was preaching. Word was sent to him. Your friend, your, your, your BFF, your, your, your homie, your ride or die, Lazarus, he, he's sick. You better come see him out. He's sick. We know you can handle all manner of sickness. So Jesus kept on teaching. He kept on preaching. Didn't, it didn't interrupt him from what he was doing. And then he received word that Lazarus was dead. And Jesus, not to start any... Hysteria among the disciples say he he sleep. We 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 going to awake him. Oh, if he sleep, then everything gonna be all right, Lord. And then he had to clarify for him. He said, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus was glad that he was not there for their sakes. He said, Show me where they laid him. No, Lord, don't don't bother with it now. If you had only been here prior to his passing. He wouldn't have died. Both sisters, Mary and Martha, used the same language to Jesus. But when they took him to the sepulcher, it was like, it's no use now, Lord. He, he, he's, he's starting to smell. We're going to have to, visitation period is over. We're going to have to keep this thing closed, and everybody's going to have to move on with their lives. And he said, no, just show me where you laid him. He said, move the stone out of the way. And then he just called the one on the inside, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth. And before he formed this sign, John calls it, he had to tell one of the sisters that I'm the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, even though he was dead, Yet will he live, and he who lives and believes in me will never die. Death, sisters and brothers, is in, imminent among all of us. We don't like to talk about it, but we all have to die. But for those who have been born again, who have pledged their faith and their unfaltering trust in God, concerning Jesus, you will live again. The songwriter said God sent his son. They called him Jesus. 
He came to love, heal, and forgive. He gave his life to buy my part. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And now I know that he holds the future. And let me encourage you with this part. The songwriter said, my life is worth the living because he lives. Isn't that good news? Your life is worth the living because Jesus lives. His preaching was not empty. His promises were not empty. He, he's proof. He's the, put, the proof in the pudding. Oh, yes, he is. That when we die, hallelujah, by and by, we'll fly away one day to be with him. Sisters and brothers, we see in this text, that it's tailored to teach us to make some adjustments to our attitude. These adjustments are Christ deserves more than just our admiration. You know, there are a lot of people in the world who just, they admire him. They, 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 they have nothing negative to say about him, but that's as far as it goes. They admire him for who he was. Even the things that he did that didn't ha that had no direct benefit to them. But we need to take it a little further than just admiration. Oh, yes, sisters and brothers. He deserves more than our admiration for who he is and especially for what he has done. He deserves our love. He deserves our devotion. He deserves our dedication. And most of all, he deserves our appreciation. Hallelujah, somebody. Do you appreciate him today? For the death that he died. They got up early that morning. The women, you know, they got some spices, some essential oils. But Jews did not believe in embalming. However, they did anointing. They did anointing for a few days to keep the stench down when rigor mortis set in on their dearly departed. Jesus' death, again by execution on the cross, sparked them to have to do everything in a hurry. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus begged Pilate, please don't, don't throw him in the lime pit like, like common criminals. Please don't, just, don't, don't throw him in the pile of bodies to be cremated. But Give it to us. And he consented. And Joseph had a, a pre-needs funeral arrangement, Sister Gatlin. He paid in advance, hoping that he would live long and prosper, but he prepared in advance his burial arrangements and had a tomb already available. And so to give him a proper burial, in haste, they had to take his body down from the cross and wrap it in linens and place him in Joseph's tomb. And from there, they thought that it was all over. Their hopes were dashed after the events that had taken place over the last few days. They had emotions at the tomb. That's our first point today. 
We need to look at their emotions at the tombs for their emotions are all over the place. Sorrow, despair, fear, anxiety, confusion were running through the camp of all of his disciples. They sheltered in place for fear of the Jews. This happened to him. They wondered among themselves what would happen to his followers. Would his death alone be sufficient for his enemies and for his critics? We got to think about their emotional state. For those especially who discovered the empty tomb. As they arrived, they saw that the stone had been rolled away and an ethereal being had communicated with Mary. He said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus of Nazareth is not here, but he has risen like he said. So you got to add unbelief to this string of emotions that they are experiencing at this time. Their intention, sisters and brothers, again, was to anoint his body. They had a mission in mind. And this is very early in the morning at at twilight, just about the break of day. They, They came there grieving, and they were overwhelmed by sadness but they realized they had a job to do. And when they got there, now all of the emotions that they're already experiencing, they're thinking that someone had been up to no good. Someone has taken the body of Jesus to mock the situation that was at hand. She even talked to Jesus, unknowing to her that it was him. Why why are you crying? What's what's going on? They've taken my Lord, and I don't know where to find him. It was then that he revealed himself to her, returned her sadness into gladness. VPTV is celebrating 10 years of television broadcasting. On February 13, 2013, Sam Smith and Debbie McLennan launch the SVP TV Network. SVP TV is currently available in over 6 million households around the world and reaching over 7 million individuals. Here's to 10 more years of influential SVP TV programming.